LOF 65-12 was a Union Pacific Railroad freight train traveling southbound from Oxnard back towards Gimco. The train was pulled by two EMD SD-70 ACE locomotives, numbered 8485 and 8481, and consisted of 17 freight cars. Metro Link Train 111 was a regional passenger train from Los Angeles Union Station to East Ventura carrying two passengers and 222 passengers. It consisted of two 2001 Bombard full second class by level passenger cars and one 1992 control car of the same type, allowing the trains to operate with a sole locomotive pushing from the rear of the train at all times. Pulling the train at the time of the accident was EMD F59 PH855. At 3.13 p.m. on the 12th of September 2008, LOF 65-12 departed Oxnard from Gamco. The driver and conductor were on the leading locomotive while the brakeman occupied the second locomotive. 21 minutes later, Metrolink 111 departed Los Angeles Union Station right on schedule. The driver was in the locomotive, which pulled the train at the time of the accident, while the conductor was in the rear car. At this point, Mr. Sanchez, the 46-year-old driver, had already exchanged a couple of text messages with an unnamed individual they are revealed to be a local railroad enthusiast. He already had spent his morning shifts texting while driving the train, exchanging around 45 messages within th- three hours. At the time, using your cell phone while driving a train was legal, but after a fatal accident in 2003, the NTSB had recommended that the Federal Railroad Administration change its stance on cell phone usage on duty. The sole result had been that train crews evaluated the importance of call or text messages and ensure proper focus on the main task which was driving the train. At 4.20 p.m., the train started to depart Chatsworth Station. It ran under a yellow signal at the time, which indicated a speed limit of 40 miles per hour. This speed limit is to adhere to the next signal and can be clearly identified. It is a mandatory procedure for the conductor and driver to call out signals to one another. But the conductor would later state the last signal he heard Sanchez call out was two signals before Chatsworth Station. At 4.21 p.m., the train ran past the red signal at the end of the double track section at 44 miles per hour. Four seconds later, Sanchez fully released the brakes again. A second later, Verizon logged Sanchez sending his sixth text message on his shift. Metrolink 111 entered the single track section unauthorized. Meanwhile, the freight train was approaching the double track section to a series of tunnels, expecting to pass into a siding ahead of the waiting Metrolink train. At approximately 4.22 p.m., the freight train left the last tunnel at 40 miles per hour and entered a 6-degree right-hand curve. At this point, the Metrolink train came into view, heading right for the freight train. At 4.22 p.m., 22 seconds after Sanchez sent his last text message, the two trains collided head-on 634 feet outside Tunnel 28. We are 
we're real close. We're just at the end of uh, Chatsworth, probably. Neither train had shaved off any speed. The Metrolink's data logger even proved that the throttle wasn't even pulled back, or a stop had been indicated before the trains collided at a combined speed of 84 miles per hour. The leading locomotive of the freight train derailed and fell over as it pushed the Metrolink's locomotive backwards, suffering extensive damage to the leading in, but with the driver's cabin remaining intact. The second locomotive remained upright but derailed with the railing freight cars piling up with it. The Metrolink's forward section was crushed by the freight train's locomotive, killing the driver on impact, and the locomotive was pushed into and partially through the leading passenger car as it fell over. It came to a rest on its side, compressed by 16 feet. The fuel tank tore off the locomotive during the collision and started a small file that failed to reach the passengers or enter the freight train. 25 people died in the collision, another 135 survived with injuries. At 4.23 p.m., emergency services received the first call relating to the collision, originating from a local resident followed by countless more calls coming in from both residents and survivors. Responders were originally dispatched to a nearby road, but information from additional calls quickly allowed them to relocate the site of the accident. The fence of an adjacent school was cut up to allow better access to the wreckage. More than a thousand responders were soon involved in the rescue and recovery effort. In addition to 28 federal ambulances, 5 rescue helicopters, and an uncounted amount of private ambulances. Within three and a half hours, the leading car was declared clear of both survivors and victims. Half the leading passenger car was completely obliterated in the collision. Almost all fatalities among the passengers occurred here, with only one passenger from the second car suffering injuries. He succumbed to a later, at a later point. The head firefighter at the site said that the wreckage was the worst sight of any of his men had ever seen. Surviving passengers told the media that the interior of the train, especially the forward two cars, has a bloodstained mess. The investigators were tasked of trying to find how the two trains could end up colliding on a single track section. What had caused such a massive tragedy? An enabling factor soon came to light. The section of track the accident happened on had no positive train control. A safety system designed to keep trains a safe distance apart. So while this alone didn't make either train enter a single track section unauthorized, it meant there was nothing apart from the crew's presence of mind that could avoid a collision. Investigators soon ruled out that the signaling system had malfunctioned, meaning one of the trains definitely ran a red signal. The driver on the freight train ensured that he did not run a red signal, a claim backed up by a surveillance camera fitted to the locomotive. The Metrolink's train driver had run a red signal, but why? It was at this point when a local TV station, KCAL-TV, broke the news that they had found a 16-year-old local railway enthusiast who claimed to have exchanged text messages with the driver throughout the day, and who had a backlog of messages sent and received to prove it. The enthusiast said he had received a series of text messages from Ch Sanchez throughout the day, which then suddenly stopped. When he went home and saw the wreckage on the news, he knew why Sanchez was, wasn't responding. The NTSB investigators proceeded to comb through the wreckage of Locomotive, but failed to recover Sanchez's cell phone. Instead, they supposed Verizon to hand over the records, finding a series of messages sent by Sanchez until, 30, until 22 seconds before the collision. Researching Sanchez's phone usage in relation to the enthusiast community revealed that he had allowed a railway enthusiast to ride in the cab of the locomotive several days before the crash and was planning to let him co-pilot the train for four stations late in the day. I'm going to do all the radio talking, you're going to run the locomotive, and I'm going to tell you how to do it. A violent breach of company protocol, not to mention laws. Sanchez also had received two prior warnings about excessive phone usage while on duty. So with that, the official cause was said to be 
intentional blindness. Meaning Sanchez was so focused on his phone, he didn't see the signal, or at least didn't see that it was red. This is similar to car drivers sometimes running red lights because they are distracted, and being sure that the light was green because their brain decided it should. An additional factor in the collision was the behavior of the conductor in the minutes leading up to the crash. Usually, it's mandatory that the driver has to call out signals to the conductor for com- confirmation. If these callouts aren't done, the conductor is to assume that the driver has become incapacitated and in it an emergency stop. Records from the Metrolink train show that the last two signals were not called out by Sanchez, but the conductor still didn't fall through with triggering a stop. Instead, unusually, the conductor reporting the starting signal at Chatsworth station to be green to the driver rather than the usual chain of reports. Following what became the worst railway accident in the United States since the 1993 Big Bio Kennet Bay Bridge disaster, several improvements to railway safety were announced. A week after the accident, the California Public Utilities Commission unanimously passed an emergency order banning cell phone usage by train crews. A week later, steps were taken to ban texting while driving cars in California also, a law that came into effect by 2009. Steps were also taken to ban cell phone usage for train crews nationwide. Congress passed the Rail Safety Improvement Act of 2008 shortly after the accident, requiring Class 1 main lines with regularly scheduled inner city or commuter rail services to implement positive train control by December 31, 2015. A few months later, a few months before the deadline, only a few railroads were anywhere near implementing positive train control causing the deadline to be moved to December 31st, 2018. This delay was cited as a contributing factor in the 2015 Philadelphia train derailment, which claimed eight lives when a train derailed in the curve at twice the speed limit, something avoidable by positive train control's speed control function. Metrolink was the first commuter system to implement positive c- train control on their trains and own tracks, even using the system for advertising. In September 2009, Metrolink unveiled a memorial plaza at Simi Valley Station, the next station the Metrolink train would have arrived at. The memorial features 11 columns, one for each of the deceased passengers who lived at Simi Valley as well as a separate column for the 14 victims from other cities and 25 personalized markers on the grounds for one for each victim. Initially, a plaque reminds visitors of the 2005 Glendale train crash, which claimed 11 lives.